We cannot talk about the assassination of Malcolm X without discussing what role the FBI or Federal Bureau of Investigation played in the plot. The book entitled In the Name of Elijah Muhammad, Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam by Matthias Gardell provides important information about why and how the FBI infiltrated the organization. It all began with a war on the other side of the world. In 1906, Japan won the Russo-Japanese War. Black Americans across political lines saw this victory as a blow against the ideology of white supremacy. They viewed the Japanese as a brown oppressed people like themselves who were rising up to defend their nation against white incursion. Nationalism was on the rise. In 1937, black nationalist Marcus Garvey claimed that Benito Mussolini, the leader of the Italian National Fascist Party, had drawn inspiration from him and his UNIA movement. He said, we were the first fascist when we had 100,000 disciplined men and were training children, Mussolini was still an unknown. Mussolini copied our fascism. Years before the genocidal potential of the movement would become known, the American Nazi party held a rally in Madison Square Garden, which attracted thousands of attendees in 1939. Instead of rejecting racial essentialism and nationalism, many minority groups borrowed its ideas and saw it as their only chance of liberation from oppressive majorities. In the 1930s, Japan dispatched activists to come to America and capitalize off of Black American sympathy for its ambitions. Japanese Reserve Major Satokata Takahashi had attempted to join Master Farr's Black Separatist pro-Asian religious group and convinced them to swear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. This effort failed, however, and by the mid-30s, those groups who had sworn allegiance to Japan had waned in influence due to several schisms. In 1941, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the United States entered World War II, pro-Japanese sentiments arose again among Black nationalist groups like the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam saw World War II as the beginning of the prophesied apocalypse, wherein God would destroy the white-dominated nations in the West and non-whites would assume their rightful place as rulers of the world. The FBI quickly began infiltrating the organization. The FBI noted that due to their hope that Japan would prevail and their belief that they were members of the Lost Found Nation of Islam, the organization refused to comply with the Selective Service Act of 1940. The FBI charged the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who had risen to leadership in 1934, his son Emmanuel, and over 50 members with draft evasion. In 1942, they were convicted and sentenced to five years in federal prison. When he was released in 1946, the Nation of Islam's membership had declined. His wife Clara had done her best to preserve the organization in his absence, but his membership had fallen from more than 8,000 people to around 1,000 people. The Mohammeds and their loyal supporters began working to rebuild. In 1952, Malcolm X, a former thief and drug dealer who had joined the Nation of Islam in prison, was released on parole. Over the next four years, he would travel around the country recruiting members with his dynamic speaking skills and setting up new temples. By 1956, FBI Director Herbert Hoover decided to increase surveillance on the Nation of Islam. He requested authorization to wiretap the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's current and future residences. He also had agents who posed as members and worked themselves up the organization's ranks until they reached the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's intimate circle. Though the Bureau recognized that the Nation of Islam's appeal stemmed from anti-Black racism and discrimination, its goal was to destroy the organization rather than the conditions from which it sprang. Their files detail their view of the Nation of Islam. The Muslim cult of Islam is composed entirely of Negroes. Its leader, Elijah Muhammad, claims to have been sent by Allah, the Supreme Being, to lead the Negroes out of slavery. Members fanatically follow the teachings of Allah as interpreted by Muhammad. They disavow allegiance to the United States, and they are taught they need not obey the law of the United States. Allegations have been received that its members may resort to acts of violence, in order to carry out its avowed purpose of destroying non-Muslims and Christianity. 
The goal of the FBI was to stop the flow of members into the Nation of Islam and eventually cause its collapse. Its first strategy was a negative press campaign. The FBI briefed selected journalists on negative aspects of the organization, namely its racial teachings, which they asked them to write about in publications like Time and the U.S. News and World Report. In 1959, a five-part TV special produced by Mike Wallace and Louis Lomax called The Hate That Hate Produced exposed the Nation of Islam to millions of Americans for the first time. The FBI campaign not only failed, it backfired. The nation continued gaining members and opening new temples. The FBI learned that publicity, whether negative or positive, benefited the organization. Changing tactics in 1962, the FBI decided to try and use information about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's lifestyle and finances to sow discontent amongst his followers. Their informants observed that while the average member of the Nation of Islam lived modestly, the organization's leadership did not. Members were told to restrict their diet and eat only one meal a day. Some were so poor they ate only bean soup for their daily meal. No sacrifice was too great in order to provide consistent donations to the nation. In 1952, the FBI estimated that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's net worth was around $75,000 or $800,000 in today's money. His real estate portfolio was worth $25,000 or almost $300,000 today. In other words, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a millionaire while his followers mostly lived in poverty. The FBI told informants to send anonymous letters to members about these facts and leak this information to the press. This effort also failed. Members simply didn't care that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad lived lavishly. In fact, they expected as much and were proud that his lifestyle was financed by their hard work. While Black middle-class church members may have become alarmed at such allegations about their pastor, the poor working-class people which the Nation of Islam attracted accepted living vicariously through the opulent lives of their leadership. The FBI decided to get more personal. They had become aware through recordings that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had engaged in affairs which were placing a strain on his marriage. The FBI authorized agents to send letters to Clara and several high-level leaders with details of his indiscretions. Malcolm X and Wallace D. Muhammad, a son of Clara and Honorable Elijah, received such letters. Clara didn't leave her husband. She didn't want to destroy the movement they had built and she depended on herself for financial support. However, she began to express her anger towards the women that her husband fathered children with and finally arranged with her husband to maintain a permanent residence at their home in Chicago while he lived in a separate home in Arizona. Over the years, Clara would increasingly travel to avoid having to face the other women her husband had relationships with. Overall, however, she remained loyal to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad until her death in 1972. The FBI's plan to cause an end to the Muhammad's marriage had failed. As for causing a mass exodus away from the Nation of Islam, this was also largely unsuccessful. Even when members found out about his relationships with women other than Clara, they justified these actions using references to polygyny in the Quran. The FBI had been successful in creating distance amongst the Nation of Islam's leadership. Malcolm X, who had become like a son to Elijah Muhammad, initially dismissed his concerns about his teacher's personal life when Elijah told him that he was like David and Solomon from the Bible. He explained that as a prophet, he was divinely selected to have multiple wives. Later, Malcolm X discovered that two women who he personally recruited to the Nation of Islam were among the women who had become pregnant by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Both women had been former girlfriends of Malcolm X before he joined the Nation of Islam and married his wife, Betty Shabazz. Malcolm X had not only been the driving force behind these women becoming members, but also recommended them for secretarial positions in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's home. He felt complicit in the fact that they had been taken advantage of, discarded when they became pregnant, and labeled as fornicators by their respective temples. Eventually, after leaving the nation, Malcolm X would help the two women file a paternity suit in civil court against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. At the same time as they were increasing distrust in Malcolm toward the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the FBI was also directing agents to plant seeds of suspicion 
in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's mind about Malcolm. Family members had already begun to remark that Malcolm was growing too powerful. An agent which had been successful in infiltrating the Muhammad's inner circle began telling Elijah Muhammad that too much power has gone into Malcolm's head. Honorable Elijah's suspicions intensified when he found out Malcolm had been sharing the information he knew about Honorable Elijah's personal life with other leaders. He believed that Malcolm was planning to form a splinter group. When President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told his spokespeople not to comment on the matter. Malcolm X disobeyed when he responded to a question about the assassination by saying that the president's death was a case of the chickens coming home to roost. The disobedience provided an opportunity for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to rein Malcolm in. He disciplined Malcolm X by forbidding him from speaking on behalf of the organization for 90 days. The FBI was pleased. The tension between Malcolm X and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was quickly becoming so thick that they need only sit back and watch it play out. While Malcolm's suspension was not permanent and he remained minister of the Harlem Mosque, his relationship with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad became more distant. FBI recordings capture the Honorable Elijah Muhammad stating in December 1963 that Malcolm is turning out just the way I thought he would. I did not think he would ever be able to take a spanking. In February 1964, FBI documents suggest taking action that could widen the gulf between the two men even further. What exactly that action was has never been released to the public. In March 1964, Malcolm's suspension was extended by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad indefinitely. That same month, Malcolm X announced his departure from the Nation of Islam. In April of 1964, Malcolm X went to Mecca to complete the Hajj, one of the five pillars of Orthodox Islam. During his travels, he was welcomed by Muslim leaders around the world and witnessed the racial diversity of Islam. When he returned, he changed his name to Al-Haji Malik El-Shabazz. The prefix Al-Haji is a special honorific given to those who have successfully completed the Hajj. He disavowed his racial separatist beliefs and stated his commitment to engage in the struggle for civil rights. He formed two new organizations, Muslim Mosque Inc. and the Organization of Afro-American Unity, or OAAU. The FBI quickly infiltrated these organizations as well. Throughout the summer and fall of 1964, he began giving interviews about his reasons for leaving the Nation of Islam. He openly revealed details of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's affairs and his belief that the Nation of Islam's sole purpose was to capture and neutralize the most dissatisfied members of the Black community. In addition to assisting with the paternity suit against the Honorable Elijah, Malcolm was also embroiled in a contentious civil court battle with the Harlem Mosque, which was attempting to evict him and his family from the organization-owned house in which they lived. The Nation of Islam responded in kind by using their newspaper, Muhammad Speaks, to publish scathing articles against Malcolm X. As early as March 1964, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was recorded on wiretaps, stating that it was time to make an example out of Malcolm. With these hypocrites, when you find them, cut their heads off, he said. Raymond Sharif, captain of the Fruit of Islam, the organization's paramilitary unit, sent Malcolm X a telegram in December of 1964, stating, The NOI shall no longer tolerate scandalizing the name of our leader and teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Minister Louis Farrakhan, who had been mentored by Malcolm X and was formerly one of his closest confidants, remained fiercely loyal to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In the organization's newspaper, he wrote, only those who wish to be led to hell or their doom will follow Malcolm. The die is set and Malcolm shall not escape, especially after such evil, foolish talk about his benefit. Such a man as Malcolm is worthy of death and would have been met with death if it had not been for Muhammad's confidence in Allah for victory over his enemies. Minister Farrakhan's words would prove prophetic. The die had been said and Malcolm X could not escape. On February 21st, 1965, Malcolm X was giving a speech in the Autobahn Ballroom in Harlem, New York. One of his bodyguards, Gene X. Roberts, switched posts with another guard and left his position guarding Malcolm on stage to begin guarding the door. A few minutes later, shots rang out. 
Gene Roberts ran to Malcolm's side and tried to resuscitate him. It was too late. Malcolm was dead. It was later revealed that Gene Roberts was an undercover agent for the Bureau of Special Services and Investigation in the New York City Police Department. After Malcolm's death, he would continue working undercover and eventually infiltrate the group which would create the New York chapter of the Black Panther Party. The crowd began beating on one gunman named Talmadge X. Hayer before police arrived and arrested him. Two other Nation of Islam members, Norman 3X Butler and Thomas 15X Johnson, were arrested as well. All three men were convicted of murder in March 1966. Just days after Malcolm X was assassinated at the annual Savers Day convention, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad remarked that Malcolm X got just what he preached. We didn't want to kill Malcolm and didn't try to kill him. We know such ignorant, foolish teachings would bring him to his own end. Malcolm X's death was mourned by figures across the political spectrum. The potential of his recent ideological shifts and the promise of his newfound mission left an immense sadness in the Black community and the world at large. In a telegram to Malcolm's wife, Betty, Martin Luther King Jr. said, While we did not always see eye to eye on the methods to solve the race problem, I always had a deep affection for Malcolm and felt that he had a great ability to put his finger on the existence and root of the problem. He was an eloquent spokesman for his point of view, and no one can honestly doubt that Malcolm had a great concern for the problems that we face as a race. In the midst of the world's grief, debates broke out about who was responsible. Talmadge Hayer confessed to Malcolm's shooting, but stated that Butler and Thomas were not his accomplices. Butler and Thomas, likewise, continuously maintained their innocence. In 1977 and 1978, Hayer signed affidavits revealing the real accomplices from Mosque No. 25 in Newark, New Jersey, who helped him commit the assassination. Norman 3X Butler, who changed his name to Muhammad Abdul Aziz, was paroled in 1985. He remained a member of the Nation of Islam and eventually became the head of the Harlem Mosque. He continued to maintain his innocence after parole. Thomas 15 X Johnson changed his name to Khalil Islam and converted to Sunni Islam before his release in 1989. He maintained his innocence until he died in 2009. Talmadge Hayer, who later changed his name to Mujahid Abdul Halim, converted to Sunni Islam and was paroled in 2010. Historians and legal experts have always raised doubts about Muhammad Abdul Aziz and Khalil Islam's involvement in the assassination. The release of a Netflix documentary entitled Who Killed Malcolm X in 2020 renewed calls for the case to be reopened. In 2021, after a new investigation, Muhammad Abdul Aziz and Khalil Islam were exonerated. The Manhattan District Attorney discovered that the FBI had failed to turn over evidence which could have excluded the two men during the trial, including eyewitness statements. They also failed to disclose to the court that one of the witnesses called to the stand was working for them as an informant. There was either one or two FBI informants in the top ranks of the Nation of Islam's leadership. Information was gained from one informant in the Harlem No. 7 mosque. Another source was identified by the FBI as a top informant whose identity had to be carefully guarded. It's possible that the two informant positions were held by one person at different times. Producer and journalist Louis Lomax believed there was one informant, and this informant was named John X. Ali. Ali was national secretary under Malcolm X in 1958 at the Harlem Mosque and transferred to Chicago in the 1960s. When journalist Louis Lomax wrote about his suspicions, John X. Ali took no legal action, which led observers to believe the accusation may have held some truth. John X. Ali was the only top laborer who was not related to Honorable Elijah Muhammad by blood. On February 19, 1965, John X. Ali allegedly checked into the American Hotel in New York. The next day, someone allegedly saw him with Talmadge hair. Also, the members of the Newark, New Jersey mosque had a reputation in the Nation of Islam as enforcers. It was a badly kept secret that they carried out vigilante justice without direct orders. They would read between the line of the nation's publications and statements to understand what actions should be taken. After initial denials, Talmadge Hayer eventually admitted that he had been an active member of the Newark mosque at the time of the assassination. While all the documents regarding their surveillance of the Nation of Islam have not been released, 
and the documents that are available are heavily redacted. Many experts believe that the FBI successfully took advantage of the Nation of Islam's existing tensions and propensity for retaliation. The most difficult part for the FBI was probably manufacturing Malcolm X's split. They couldn't know for certain that the Honorable Elijah would extend Malcolm's suspension or that Malcolm wouldn't simply accept the punishment. But neither man was well acquainted with the FBI's tactics to overcome the pressure bearing down on them both. For his part, Honorable Minister Farrakhan seems to regret having unwittingly participated in the FBI scheme. While the rumors that the Nation of Islam ordered Malcolm X to be killed are not true, it's impossible to ignore the climate created by the articles printed in the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, which led members to believe Malcolm's death would be righteous justice. Imam Warth Muhammad believes that his father didn't want Malcolm dead, but he did want him silenced. He wanted his towering presence on the international stage to disappear. And could your father have raised his hand and stopped oh, yes. these attempts which everybody knew were taking place? Yes, yes. I believe that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was in absolute control of his following, Nation of Islam. All during the life of Malcolm X and at least for a year or two or more after his assassination. And Abu Dhabi Muhammad uh, had no, uh, no motivation uh, uh, to uh, stop uh, uh, Malcolm from being harmed uh, because he wanted to see that problem out of his hair. You know, it, was, it was a real problem. serious thing you've just said. Yes. I'm sure he wanted to see Malcolm, Malcolm Silas. I'm sure he didn't want him to be killed. If it could have been done by some other way, I'm sure he would have rather to be done by some other way, or some other way, but uh, be done some other way. But um, I'm certain that only Elijah Muhammad was being quiet and watching things and, and knowing that Malcolm was being um, uh, attacked at his home, firebomb. Uh, uh, and that people were out to kill him, and I think he was just waiting to hear that Malcolm is dead, so I don't have to worry about this man anymore. Wouldn't there be another way? He knew that Malcolm loved him. Fly him out to Chicago. No, that no, the, sit him down. No, that relationship had uh, had uh, become uh, had was gone. It had gone. It was destroyed. The relationship was destroyed by then. There was no way for Elijah Muhammad to call Malcolm, and they sit down and reason with each other. No way. So it was inevitable. Yes, but I know one thing, that after all, Elijah Muhammad was free of Malcolm as a problem, as a person accusing and, and contending with him, he began to really suffer the, uh, uh, the well, I, I guess some guilt that he didn't stop it, you know. I was at the table with them once, same big table that they used for dinner, dinner and also the conference table. After dinner, when dinner was served, it was a conference table. So we were sitting down, and he was sitting there after Malcolm's assassination, some months after the assassination. And he rested his hand on his, on his, his head on his hand like this. He hardly ever would do that unless something was heavy on it, very heavy on it. He rested his head like this, and he said, I wish the boy wasn't, hadn't been killed. And that's what he said. Well, that's what he said. Well, that's what he said. Well, that's what he said. He didn't talk about it. He just said that. That's all. I wish the boy hadn't been killed. Other incidents involving heretical members had ended in violence. Malcolm's death was predictable. However, it seems the bitterness left by Malcolm's departure kept the Honorable Elijah Muhammad from taking a high profile and bold action to prevent it. Perhaps he believed Malcolm X would eventually come back. Honorable Minister Farrakhan alleges that Malcolm was attempting to return before his death, although this hasn't been confirmed by any outside sources. Imam Warth, who was initially put out of the Nation of Islam with Malcolm X, eventually returned by asking for his father's forgiveness. While he claims this was due to his concern about the welfare of the remaining members and Malcolm X's followers, others say he was fearful after Malcolm's murder that he would be next. The Nation of Islam continued on, 
After the Honorable Elijah Muhammad died in 1975, his son Warth Muhammad assumed leadership. Within two years, Imam Warth changed the organization's name, sold its properties, disbanded the fruit of Islam, and disavowed the theology surrounding Master Fard. His goal was to move the nation of Islam to Orthodox Islam. In 1977, the Honorable Minister Farrakhan split from Imam Warth's new organization to revive the nation of Islam under its old teachings. To date, it has never lived up to the fears of the FBI that it would one day turn its loyal members and sympathizers against non-Muslims, Christians, or the white race. Under Farrakhan's leadership, the lost found nation of Islam continues to await the destruction of the white-dominated world.